All right, everyone. Uh, once again, welcome to another uh, Thursday night class. So for tonight, the topic, as you can see on the screen, we're going to be talking about how to find and also how to follow a trading plan. So a lot of people may have already noticed the way that I do uh, my planning, my trade that I execute, everything that I do, I have predetermined before I even enter a trade, before I even think about entering a trade. Everything is uh, basically pre pre uh, predicted beforehand. Everything is already mapped out, I would say, so that I understand the risk and also the possible reward. And like a lot of you already know, I'm always planning for the red side of the trade. Even if it doesn't happen, I want to be prepared for the worst so that when the good side does happen, which I assume it does because I have confidence in myself, just like you guys should as well. I'm not freaking out when a massive green candle hits. If I'm in calls, I'm not uh, like overthinking where I'm going to sell. I want to prepare for the worst. And then when the best does happen, I go with the flow in the moment. I don't want to expect green. And then when red hits, I'm not prepared. I'm focused on, I want to sell green and I don't want to sell for a red loss when you have to sometimes. Selling for a small loss is normal. A lot of people can't do that. So I'm going to try and walk you guys through basically what I look for, how I wait, how I have my patience, and of course, how I execute and keep my low risk, high reward in my favor with everything that I do. So to start off with what we're going to be talking about, let's pull up a chart real quick. So I want you guys to realize every trade, uh, and just a class idea, can we have a volume class as well? We will definitely have a volume class, and I'll speak on this real quick. A lot of the stuff that's more in-depth than just what you visually see as a new trader, aka candlesticks, trends, patterns that you may not even understand what they are, but you can see them without knowing the definition, I want to really cover the basics because I feel a lot of people in here, they may not even know how to trade, and if they do know how to trade, they're not profitable. So I don't want to throw trading setups, trading indicators, trading systems out there until people understand how to work before you get into a trade. The biggest thing I think a lot of people overthink is you have to have a plan. And many people, they don't, they're not taught that. They don't see the big traders having that plan. All they see is the profit. They see how they entered, how they got out. The mental side is what really gets the attention for a new trader, in my opinion. But when you see money, all that stuff is thrown out the window. Technical analysis, mental capacity, emotional standpoints, so with time, Ange, we are going to get into more, I, I don't want to say high tech systems, but things that you need to know when you're in a trade, things that you need to know before entering that give you that upper hand outside of just like a plan set up and how to actually execute and whatnot. So to start off the class, I am going to just pull up SPY only because this is obviously the overall market. And I feel a lot of people, they understand and they usually watch or at least know what SPY has been doing on the day of. So with SPY, I kept all the levels that we've had the past few days. And just like the class we had uh, the other night, a lot of stuff may be repetition for you guys with visuals, not the actual content and the verbal uh, words I'm going to use. But I just hope that you guys can bear with me and you can follow through with what I may be talking about, because a lot of this is very uh, I don't want to say foreign, but it's not very known for a lot of new traders. Like, how do you actually plan before entering a trade? Many people are taught you enter and figure it out, or you enter off this level and then sell when you're green, sell for a loss when you're red. But what are you actually preparing for before you even enter? What are you looking for? What is the process of knowing who you are? Are you on the smaller frames when you may have little patience? So you have to be on the smaller frames, or do you have a lot of patience and you can deal with the larger picture and having to hold a trade longer than just a few minutes, a few hours. This is hopefully going to be an eye opener for a few people that may not even know what type of trader they are, whether it's a swing trader, a day trader, a scalper, maybe you're even like longer than a swing trader, a leap trader. So there's a lot of different uh, technicalities that we're going to talk about. And as we do, well, as I mention stuff, I hope that you guys can ask questions and maybe uh, reach out about like, I don't have much patience. What do you recommend for me? Uh, I never use any time frame higher than the 30 minute because I'm a scalper. Like, how can I use larger frames to help with a scalping system? A lot of people don't realize just because you're on a larger picture for the uh, chart, it doesn't mean you can't scalp. Knowing where the chart is on the larger frame can be used to a very high advantage if you are a scalper. 
understanding on the larger frame, there may be a major support zone. So on the smaller picture, when you see those trends form on the bullish side, you can hold that trade longer in your favor. Knowing on the larger frame, this is a bounce zone. So a lot of things are going to come into like a bigger picture like frame as you hear me talk. And hopefully as people interact and ask questions or have their own ideas that they personally use. So first thing I want to talk about, and I'm hoping you guys can be a little interactive, who here thinks that they are not very patient? And when I say patient, I mean, you enter a trade and instantly you're thinking, oh man, like this, this could be bad. Or maybe you enter and you're thinking, okay, I'm green, but maybe I don't want to hold longer because what if it goes back to red? Many people and even if you aren't this way, you can say that. I'm, I'm not. I used to be, but I'm better now. Everyone has that issue. I have the issue at some point, and I have to break down, okay, why am I this way? Did I oversize? Did I enter later than where I initially wanted my play to be executed? And I can actually use today's example off of SPY to show you guys why I did not trade today. So many people, when you say, oh, I didn't make a trade today. Oh, well, why didn't you trade? Like, if you would have bought after the bottom, you would have made money if you held the entire day. I get that. But you also have to realize people trade based off a system. People trade based off who they are, what they know works for them. And it's not always about making money, it's about preserving money. It's about having money to keep and grow it long term and not just hit big one day, possibly lose the next day. No exact system is 100%, which I'm sure you guys are starting to realize I say this all the time. No system is going to give you an 100% hit rate. You're going to have losses, but can you manage those losses? So looking at SPY today, the first thing, which I'm not going to talk about, oh, my levels were very good. The bounce happened where I wanted it. I'm just focused on the bottom that happened. For me personally as a trader, as you all know, I am very patient. I have, it took me a long time to get this way and I'm still working on it, obviously. I may look like I have the most patience you've seen out of anybody, but I still like, I dabble with not following the plan. Everyone has issues. Everyone fall, uh, like falls out of their system. It happens. That's human nature. So me speaking on this, I'm hoping you realize, don't think if you mess up, you're a failure. You're going to mess up. You're going to force a trade you know you shouldn't and you won't realize it until maybe the next day or at least when you close the trade for a win or a loss, you realize, man, I got lucky when I made money on that trade. Or if you lose, it's like I should not have lost that trade because I never should have entered in the first place. Having common sense and having that self-talk of telling you, like telling yourself, whether it's in the mirror, in your journal, or just mental thoughts, I cannot do that again. It's difficult for me at times, but I've realized if I want this to work long term and I keep having that, that uphill slope of success, I can't fall back into the patterns that make me lose. I have to figure out what I have to cut out and what I have to keep in my arsenal to make myself not even just successful, but happy as a person. If you let that outside life get into your trading life, and I'm sure people can relate to this, emotions outside of trading always carry in and you do stuff you know you shouldn't do. In the moment, you may not realize it. But the after effect, that's what people finally come to terms with. I never should have even showed up today. I never should have sized that heavy. You have to be extremely like computer-based when you're thinking about trading. You can't be emotional. You can't have hopes of anything because nothing is guaranteed. So when focusing on patience, do you want quick returns? Are you a swing trader? I like to tell people like zones, the gaps, the main levels. When looking at, like, obviously, I had a level around the bottom. That's nice. But I'm going to show you why I did not make my personal entry. And if you guys did play this, I would love to hear about it. If you saw the move happen on SPY and you watch this entire thing push to the upside, if you didn't make a trade, don't think that was a failure day. And Ansh just said, I did play that. That's perfect. Me personally, and I talked to Ansh about this uh, after hours when the market was closed, what I was looking for on this setup so as you can tell, we had straight trends after hitting the bottom. I'm on the five minute right now, guys. I don't want to be on the one minute. I want to keep it on like a frame that most people tend to use. Scalpers or day traders usually have the five minute pulled up at some point throughout the day. So using this, I am very heavy on catching and finding those trends on pullbacks. And what I was focused on today was an idea of a heavy pullback back to where we tried to break out heavy before the bottom happened on the day. We had a lot of wickups, as you can tell. 
I'm going to try and make this more enlarged so these candles are a bit bigger. All these wicks try to break out. And when we finally hit the bottom, it was just a straight rocket to the upside. For me and how I am as a person, as a trader, what I've learned to follow and not jump outside the box. Obviously, if I chased this at any point, I would have made money. That's not going to be the case every time this setup happens, though. Yes, you'll make money, but it's not going to happen every single time. So I'm focused on low risk, high reward. What was my plan? What was my, I have to follow this before I execute. I have to figure out a system. What I like to do, the previous hesitation, which if you also want to categorize this as the previous lower high, on the bearish trend on the downside. This area right here, as we broke to the upside, I wanted to see a recontest with this area. Yes, we had that little wick, but it was not as low as I wanted. I wanted this on SPY. The area would have been roughly about 437.5 area. On S, uh, the SPX, it was around 4402, I think, 4401 area. I wanted to get, see a dip. It only dipped to about on SPX 4405 area, 4404.5. It didn't go low enough to my personal standards that I planned ahead of time. Just because we dip and we're two points away, I'm not going to tell myself, oh, it was close enough. I'm going to enter. I'm sticking to what I wanted because if I would have chased that and say we did drop two extra points and we never had a push back to the upside, me rushing that extra two to three point drop on SPX could have cost me an extra 20 to 30% loss of my play. I'm focused on the red side. Notice how I have not even talked about the upside yet. I'm always planning, where am I going to cut if I'm wrong? I don't care about the upside before entering because if it happens, I'll plan in the moment. I don't want the hope of, oh, I'm red. I'm going to wait and see if it goes back to green so I can sell for a profit. I'm only preparing for the downside for how I personally trade. If you don't do that, that's fine. But hopefully what I say can maybe resonate with you or give you a new perspective as to what you could include to your trading. Because maybe you've been green 20%, 30%, and the trade goes back to red on, the, on that like position. And then you're freaking out. Oh, I could have sold at 30%. Now I'm down 10%. I don't want to sell for a loss, though. A lot of people, including myself, I was the same way. I'd be up 30, then I'm back to break even. Oh, man, I should have sold at 30%. What was I doing? The trade goes back up 30%. And then I sell and it keeps going up to the upside even more. What was I really looking for outside of, I wish I would have sold when I had the chance. Now that I have a second chance, I'm just going to get out because that's what I wanted initially. Not realizing we had a pullback after being up 30%. That's holding a support now. A pullback kept you at break even, maybe minus 5% red and never went lower. So why are you letting a 30% gain trick you into thinking, I have to get out of this? I like to use that for my personal uh, like explanations when I journal, when I look back on my plays and figure out like what could I have done different? Maybe I didn't enter on a play like today. What could I have done different? And for me, today, there was nothing to change. I had a plan for a specific bounce I wanted on a pullback. It never happened. So in that instant, as this doesn't pull back as low as I wanted it, like if SPY would have had the pullback I went on SPX, it would have been around where this highlight is. So as this pushes up now, I'm looking for the next pullback from the previous lower high. Does this make sense to you guys? I'm using the bearish trends, and as they flip bullish on this bottom out and we push back up, I'm using the previous lower highs for the next higher lows. I'm translating what happened into what's currently going on. That is how I lower my risk, because now that I have these levels, if I enter on a pullback here, my cut level is the previous higher low. I'm using a level system for my plan. That is how I like to do how I trade. So when looking at this from a different perspective now, and I hope you guys can uh, be a little interactive when I ask this, what is your time frame that you like to trade on? And if it is a, a smaller frame, I hope that you're a scalper. If you want to include that as well, I'm a scalper. I like to trade on the one minute. I'm a day trader. I like to have the five minute and the 15. I want to hear what you guys have to say so I because I can literally tell who you are as a trader based off what time frame you're on, what kind of trader you are. There's not much I have to really dig into with people when I just know the time frame and the type of trader you are. If you're a scalper, you don't have patience. If you're a, a swing trader, you have patience to trust the chart. Yes, as a scalper, you have to trust the chart. I get that, but you're looking for that quick in and out. 
a lot of scalpers don't catch the entire move because they're going to roll up profits. They're going to take gains quick and then look for the next entry on a roll up. So if they're buying like the uh, 435 call, they sell for a gain. Now they're looking at the 336 call. They're taking their profits and rolling up. So I can usually find a good center point as to how people are. And that's how I can teach you guys more like in a one-on-one -on -one setting and have future lessons planned out to really correlate with who you are as people. So I'm seeing a lot of smaller frames as of right now. I think the bit, yeah, we have a one hour, a daily, DPAC, five, 15, one hour daily, solid panis, one minute, oh, five minute. Nick said 15 minute, D slash W. And that's good. You have a larger daily and the weekly. Donnie said five or 15. Notice how no one here so far, which there we go. Now we got it. No one at the time said the one minute. If anyone says the one minute from my personal experience and what I portray as a person, that's a scalper mentality. No one swings on the one minute, in my personal opinion. People can do it, but you're not seeing the bigger picture. Ansh just said he does like the one minute. I know how Ansh trades, so I can see why he says that. He is a very quick level player on the day of. He likes to use that, and that's a huge advantage to people that scalp. You need to see those smaller uh, time frames. So when using now that you like reached out and said, this is the time frame I use, what time of the day do you guys like to trade the most? Most scalpers that have the one minute, the two minute, they're, they're usually tending open to about 1030 a.m. Eastern. They want to see the momentum happen. And that's, and yeah, two people already said open. Smaller time frame people usually like open because the volatility, the movement, it's very quick. So in and out, maybe a five minute trade, they made a quick 30, 40% intraday if you're playing the scalp as a one minute or a two minute trader you may not get that volatility and that push that you'll see it open so donnie said around 10 when it settles down a bit ramin 10 to 11 one one 130 to three so you all you guys are using what fits you and this is perfect having a variety of different people that trade is great to have as a group because now we have more to talk about there's not one just setting of people it's a whole diverse group. So we can dive into different perspectives, get different ideas from people that may not use like end of the day trading like Ramin does. This may spark interest to someone. If I talk about scalping it open, you may think, okay, this is kind of not my style. I'm going to stick to what I already do. It's always good to hear different perspectives, even if you won't use that in your trading style. And I feel many people, they only want to learn what they do now. Having an idea of what other people do, it gives you an opportunity to see if you want to branch out or add more to your arsenal. So when looking at SPY, if I pull up the open, obviously it was a straight downtrend. Right off over, we dropped. Some pullbacks, but nothing held in the five minute. It was all straight red candles until we hit that level on basically the low on the day and we started to uptrend. When using open, and I know Ann said that he did catch the move. Did you catch the sell off at open or did you catch the actual intraday push end of the day? And I'm sure he's going to say the end of the day push. I think he mentioned that earlier. Yeah, so he caught the actual push. Was there a reason you did not play open? Was it kind of just like there was no level correlation? The move was so quick you didn't want to rush into puts and then you would have forced the trade when we were already low on the day. Your patience was amazing and i'm hoping other people realize that when looking at this chart if you didn't catch open a lot of people are like oh i missed the opening put, uh, puts i missed the, the play of the day the whole time and yes i didn't play the actual move that happened the intraday move was the move of the day this push it was straight continuation the pullbacks didn't happen for what i wanted but that's the reason i wait and i'm patient because i want to have that low risk high reward my trade plan, I have to follow. Even if I would have broken away from the plan, I would have made money. Multiple times I was telling people today, I could chase and I, I, I want to buy so bad. I, I have FOMO. I feel the FOMO, but I'm not going to act on it because my discipline is outweighing what I hope will happen. I don't want to put hope into my uh, trading system because when I journal, I already know that's going to make me like feel stupid as a person. The idea that I knew I shouldn't do something and I did it. So when you have this plan, whether for like Ange, he didn't, he said, uh, I, I didn't like the open. The futures were down a lot. I was thinking to take puts, but just did not like the PA. So he didn't like the price action. If most traders understand the purpose of a sell off at open, from my 
back testing I've done, my historical analysis, usually 70% to 80% of the time when we drop overnight with futures and we open up red on the S&P, like we drop right at open, SPY, S&P, the NASDAQ, whatever it may be, usually 70% to 80% of the time we push intraday into end of the day. We don't finish green, but we have a retraction to the upside. That puts odds in your favor. That's a plan that I follow for myself because I back tested it and I understand the risk of me buying calls intraday, if there's a level that it bounces off of, which as you can tell, I had a level on here around SPY. It wasn't the exact bottom, but for the SPX, I did basically have that uh, 4385 level as the bottom. You can use your levels and then use outside information like I, uh, I talked about last night. Use more than one biased opinion. For like what I just said, 70% to 80% of the time when I back tested futures are down overnight and then we open up straight downside, we tend to push eight out of 10 times intraday, seven out of 10 times. So if that correlates with the level, it's like a double positive as to why I should enter calls. If I enter light and trust the move from a plan perspective, right away, okay, I'm sizing light, I'm trusting the move. I'm not going to risk as much money if I'm wrong. If I use that egotistic mindset and the idea of I don't want to miss this because last time we had this drop off open and we pushed uh, intraday into end of the day, I didn't size heavy enough and I missed out on way more money than I could have made. First mistake in what I just said, don't think about it from a financial perspective. Money will make you go outside of your trading style. You'll not follow the plan and that's fine. But you have to understand if you size light and trust the move, you're going to make more money because you have no emotions. And if you oversize one little pullback or consolidation, like what happened right here, this could cause you to sell early if you're oversized. Then you're going to miss out on the rest of the move. Maybe if you're size super light, you can hold until this push into the end of the day. Maybe you'll sell around this area where this consolidation was. So many people that I have tried helping, so many people that I've seen hit a huge milestone of success green after green week after struggling for so long they think they're invincible and it's not an issue with them it's just they see their potential and they want to execute based off i've been super good i've been nine out of ten on trades nine wins one loss i want to take my chances and size heavier as they lose they don't focus on i got to size back down they want to make back what they lost now so many people have the idea of i want to make back what i lost instead of focusing on why did I lose that much money? What made me oversize? It all comes back to self. I'm always talking to you guys about self-accountability, uh, self-explanation, looking yourself in the mirror. No one's making you lose besides who you see when you look in that mirror or after you're done with the trade, who's around you at the end of the day. It's just you usually. So you can't put the effect of the market was wrong. It shouldn't have happened that way. You're finding an excuse to not change what you did wrong or you're finding an excuse to realize, I don't wanna confront my problems. I just wanna blame whatever I can, I'll come back tomorrow. A lot of people and myself included, I'm trying to use my historical problems to show you guys everyone has been this way. I would lose a trade and I would just walk away and not even reflect on what I did wrong. I come back the next day, probably uh, repeat the same thing I just did, hoping it goes in my favor when logically and from a like reasonable standpoint, it's not gonna work out. People chase, what they want, but they don't deserve it. And if they do finally hit that one time, they think it's just going to work every single time, chasing the play, chasing the breakout because they missed it last time. They didn't catch the bottom, so they want to catch it intraday even before a pullback may happen. That's all normal. But you have to realize, and one of my favorite quotes that I like to tell people, no trade is the best trade. Saving money instead of risking to make money is going to save you an emotional stress when you're trading maybe even in your personal life. So don't ever think you have to trade or force a trade because you missed the move or maybe, oh, I just want to make a few bucks today. I still have that thought process. I'll tell people, man, I want to get in so bad, but I know the minute I get in, it's going to go right against me because I wanted initially to get in at the bottom. And now that we're up at the high of the day, the one time you enter, oh, it's coming right back down. And I hate looking at that and telling myself, I knew I shouldn't have done that. Why am I still repeating what I've basically taken out of my trading style? I'm going back to who I was a year ago when I said, I can't do this. Who I want to be in the future is not who I'm acting like right now.
And using that discipline, it's so difficult. But when you stick to a plan and you have to follow it, no one can teach you to follow a plan. I can't teach you how to follow. I can teach you how to make a plan for who you are as a trader, but I can't make you not FOMO, not chase the play, not average down because you're red and you want to make sure you get back to green. I can't make anyone do that because your actions speak for itself. I can teach you what I've done. I can show you what I've done. But end of the day, it's all up to you. And that's why I like to tell people, you have to confront what you've done because I can't just look at what you did and say, you can't do this. As much as you'll hear me say it, you're not going to process it probably. And when you do process it, you'll follow what I said. You'll follow what I said. Having those back-to-back -back green trades, those back-to-back -back, uh, green weeks, eventually you're going to fall out of that system because you think you're untouchable, you're invincible, and everyone takes 20 steps back when they were just taking two steps forward. And then next thing you know, you're back to where you were two months ago and you grew so well with compound with the account, even compound with who you are as a person. And I'm hoping you guys are realizing, like I'm talking from a mental perspective with everything, trading the system, trading with indicators, whatever you use for who you are as a trader. It's so simple because you're visually seeing what you have to do, but can you execute off of that? Like, can you follow the system? Can you actually follow the plan and not lean off because that one day you want to make extra money or, oh, I have an extra 500 bucks in my buying power. I want to use this before the 4 p.m. Eastern hits. I don't want to keep money because it feels like I didn't do nothing today. There is no such thing as I didn't do it or I missed out on the trade. You know how many days we have left the trade? Obviously, we don't know the exact number, but it's a lifetime. Until you quit, that's when the trades are done. So don't think you have to make these huge gains every single day. You have to force the trades, slowly grow, and let the money come in with you. That's the best advice I can probably give for a trading system. So I want you guys to also think about this as well. And I'm going to switch over to, uh, let me go to Google, because that was the first one someone mentioned earlier. And I am going to have to search this up, because I don't know where Google is on this list. So as we go through these other stocks, obviously uh, I have not looked at many of them. So I'm not gonna have a lot to say right away until I really observe what's going on. But if anyone took trades on Google today, uh, don't be afraid to let me know or just mention it to me, but I'm gonna use the larger time frame on Google only because if it's still in the same area, which it is, I can give you a broad perspective on a trading plan and how to basically use a larger picture for the system. A lot of people like to day trade, that's fine. But end of the day, when you day trade, where is the actual price action on the bigger picture? If we're at a heavy support zone, you should be looking at calls on the smaller frame. If we're at a heavy resistance zone, you should be focused on puts. And if we break on the upside, look for that continuation with calls on the smaller frames. So, uh, but I got to say, Mr. Trey, I can't say the actual name, but uh, Mr. Trey is, is swinging the uh, 125 calls. So looking at Google, on the larger picture, and as you guys can tell, I have a falling wedge, which logically from a textbook material, a falling wedge tends to break on the upside. If I zoom out even more on this Google chart, which I already know what it is, but I want you guys to see this, look at this setup. From a bigger picture perspective, logically, where is Google going? Not tomorrow, not next week, but with time, where is the potential of this trade? Is it downside or upside? So someone already said 144. And obviously that's where my yellow highlight is, but we're looking at upside. This setup, we had all of this buying pressure that was rejected. There was not enough buyers to push it above. Now that we're holding above the historical rejection as support, logically and from a textbook standpoint, Google is bullish on the larger picture. So being a scalper, being a day trader, or like Mr. Trade swinging, you know the probability is in your favor if you're looking at calls for Google. If you take the accountability of a class we talked about last week, sector rotation, tech has been hot, communication sectors is hot, use that to your advantage. Google is in both of those. So knowing the chart is bullish on the bigger picture, cup and handle, forming that handle, holding the trends on the smaller frame. Now, if I go down to the 30 minute again, we are literally riding the support zone and also this wedge. 
buying pressure has held this for almost a week straight. Yes, it's going up, back down, up, back down. But when we broke on the downside, we massively pushed right back inside that wedge. That shows strength. So as a day trader, as a scalper, focus on when we have a massive pullback on Google, that should be a loading point for call. Size light, trust the move. Uh, but how far out do you plan the swing? I'm so used to rippy scalps. So even though I see the swing potential, how far out do I plan my expiration date? So the biggest thing about a swing trader, they have to go off how they are as a trader, like who they are as a person. For me personally, I like to use the historical movements and kind of base that off how long could it take to move upside? How long could it take to break out of this falling wedge or at least contest the top of this wedge again? Which if we use the top of this wedge, we're also using the previous lower high. Yes, we have another one right here. I do understand that. So we have two levels on the upside that we're looking for gap fills. We got this level and we got this level. If we break these two on the upside, it's going to move quick. So the idea of how much time should I add? How much money can you afford for a contract if you add extra time to it? If you have the money to spare, you can add a month out and you can trust the move that's going to happen. If you don't have much money, you may either have to fall back on Google and not trade it, or you have to look at the scalping on the day of, hedge the pullbacks, because on the larger picture, you know Every pullback is bought up. If you look at Google here on the 30 minute, this zone right here on the bottom, and I'm going to lower this uh, red a little bit. Where's the, come on. So the top of this red, the very top right here, these wicks are holding every time. So if we have a pullback on Google, that should give you an idea because you know on the larger picture now, this is usually a bounce zone. If I go back to the five minute for Google, this sell-off had opened, a lot of people, and I'm not saying like anyone here or myself, but that could have been like, I got to get puts before it's too late. Not realizing if they don't zoom out, this is the perfect chance to buy calls and swing those calls, whether it's the week of expiration, next week, the July uh, monthly for the 21st, you have to use the larger picture to your advantage. Just because you're a scalper doesn't mean you're only looking at the, the one minute, the five minute, the 15 you can use the larger and notice, okay, there's a large buying zone here. There's a massive support. So if we pull back in this area and show some strength, I can scout calls back to the upside. Looking at it on the smaller, huge sell-off. Why do I want to buy calls? It's selling off. A lot of red candles. I'm scared. Zoom out and realize why you should get calls. That is a bounce point. You can use that to your advantage as a scalper. So going back to the question of like, how much should I plan for an expiration date? What can you afford? If you play two months out, the contracts are going to be outrageous unless you play like the 200 calls or something. So you have to look at it from like, what can I afford with my account size? If you can't afford two months out or a month out or two weeks out, you may have to play the week of and just wait for a dip and trust the dip, trust the chart. Just like the class we talked about earlier. Trust the chart, not your emotions. Don't have hope. Let the chart do the work. Size light. Trust the play. Google on the larger picture for the swing traders that are in here. It's literally a bullish setup. We are not going to be bearish until we fall and break. Honestly, for my personal thoughts, this area right here, this red highlight currently, if we break inside this again and start the zone, we could potentially keep zoning on the downside and slowly trend that way. But until we actually pull back again, it's just going to be another loading zone. There's no reason to freak out if Google has that sell-off because we are holding right where a swing trader wants it. This is a swing trader's dream for a setup, literally. If you ask anyone that likes cup and handles or the price action of a falling wedge, holding strength with buying pressure on low volume, this is where you want to swing a contract in this area. If you can afford it, focus on the gap fill. The gap fill is the trend line. So if we use this trend line as an example, you can grab a 120 call, a 125, a 130 call even. Because if we do break out of the trend, we're focused on this next area of a rejection possibly. And that's a massive gap it has to fill on the upside. Yes, there is a lot of wicks right here as well around this area, but focus on the major push if tech stays hot if communication sector stays hot. Uh, 
So Perez, you said like by using ATR of a stock, uh, I'm not good with abbreviations. What is ATR exactly? Uh, give me a quick definition. You're going to say this. I'm probably going to be like, oh, duh, that's what it is. Yeah, average true range. So yeah, you're basically using like the range of confirmation, I would say. Yeah, Ansh just said average true range. So when you're using that range area, it's the same as like uh, FVG, fair value gap. You're focused on where is that level for most people, it's a pullback. It's a scare tactic. The ones that know what to look for, they're taking that quote unquote sell off, that drop off. That's the true range right there. That is where people want that to pull back and hold value because that's the loading zone. That is where people that have the big money load shares, not just contracts, but shares. If you miss the entry for shares before the push, this is now your potential to get in. Will this break out to the upside 10 out of 10? No, there is a chance it can fail, but that is why it's a low risk, high reward. Instead of buying calls on a push up to this first highlight that I'm moving, you're trusting the chart entering down here, letting the chart do the work for you. You're not buying in and having that hope of, I really hope this keeps pushing. I hope the volume picks up. I hope people chase this and move it higher. You want to buy in when others are fearful. And a lot of people, that's their plan. If you're on a smaller frame, like I was saying earlier, you're scared seeing red candle, red candle. But knowing the bigger picture, like Mr. Trades was saying, he is swinging Google, the 125 calls. He understands the potential with this. A lot of people that didn't zoom out today, they saw that sell off at open, and they're probably thinking, like, we're going to keep uh, dropping. We're not going to push back up. There's no way. We literally just filled the gap to the downside. Now we're pushing back up. Every, like I told you guys, every resistance that breaks on the upside usually gets recontested at some point. Many people on the smaller picture don't realize that until the push happens and they zoom out at the end of the day. Oh man, I missed a major dip by opportunity. People have to recognize that. So I'm going to switch over to Tesla. I may have to search now. I can see it right there. So let's look at Tesla now. Tesla, this is a perfect example because for a swing trader, they know the bigger picture. They know we're out of rejection. Do they want to start a swing trade right now? Or are they focused on scalping? Or are they focused on, I want to buy this right now because we're at a very like middle zone. It's a 50-50 chance it will keep going. It could pull back. So many people understand that. And just like the example with Google, this trend break on the downside, I guarantee many people thought like Tesla's done for, it's going to keep dropping. This was just another chance to buy the dip. If I'm on the smaller picture with uh, Tesla on the five minute here, and I'm going to make this a little bit wider, we're consolidating. We had that push after hours. Now we're holding for three days straight. Smaller picture wise, people could say, oh, this is holding. We're going to send. Buyers are keeping it up. Or they could be looking at the opposite. We had a heavy sell off today. We tried to push back up and we had a rejection. Now we're trending downside after hours. This is going to sell off tomorrow. There's two sides of the story. So if you're in uh, conclusive as to what you should do, zoom out. Even if you're a scalper, zoom out. Don't play Tesla because, oh, we sold off after hours. This is going to tank tomorrow. I'm going to get puts. What's the bigger picture telling you? What is the plan that you're going to set up as a scalper knowing what the bigger picture presents to you? So using Tesla, I have to zoom out even more. Let's go to the four hour. So I don't trade Tesla. I'm speaking based off the chart. If you guys have different ideas, different uh, visuals that you see since you actually trade it, please speak up and let me know. I'm literally going off what I see and I may not even be talking correctly based off what you guys actually trade if you do trade this stock. But from what I see right now with Tesla, we're holding at the same rejection zone before we broke out. We had a consolidation, pullback, send, pullback, send, pullback. We rejected and started forming that cup. Curled, now we're pushing back to the upside. Tesla, for me personally right now, is it worth to scalp or is it better to swing? With how I see it, you should want to scalp or day trade this because Tesla, you don't know where the direction is going to go. Yes, it can send. Yes, it could drop off. But do you want to risk a swing trade overnight, not knowing the potential of it being 50-50, basically? Tesla tried to have the breakout in the past few days, and it hasn't had enough strength. So could we align to the same sell-off like it has happened before on a, 
a push after a drop and we sell off the next few days. Is this a stock that you want to put into your arsenal of this is my plan, I'm going to follow it? Or do you just want to wait, put it on the back burner, wait for a better setup and put your eyes on a more secure, more low risk, high reward stock? Tesla's had a massive move. Massive. So do you want to put into consideration, I want to catch the next one, or do you want to wait for the better opportunity? Because looking at the bigger picture, we're at the highs right now. How much can Tesla keep going? Yes, it can, I understand. But from a logical perspective, how much higher can this go? And if it does go higher, is it worth the swing or is it worth the scalp? If you're a scalper and it's worth a swing trade, you may not want to touch it. But if you're a swing trader and Tesla looks like just a scalp trade for one day or maybe a, a, a day trade, you may either have to avoid trading it or switch your plan around and realize if I scalp this, I won't get the major move I want. I'll have to take maybe 25%, 30% gains. Maybe I have to size less because as a scalper, I can't risk a larger position like a swing trade because I have less time. The IV is going to affect me more. Theta is going to destroy my contract if I'm wrong. That's where this planning comes in. What is the sizing you want to use? What is your actual contract and the expiration? You should have this plan before entering because then when you enter the trade, you're prepared for whatever happens. No emotions. And if there are emotions, you oversized, you rush the trade, you enter where you should not have entered. You have to consider all this stuff. And I know a lot of people are like, that's so much work. Why do I want to do that? Trading may not be for you because this is all about preparation. Making money in the market's easy, but keeping it and growing it is the hardest part for everybody. Everyone's had a massive win. I guarantee it. Everyone's also had a massive loss that took everything away. So what are you really trading for? Make a plan and figure out who you are as a trader. Are you a scalper? Are you a day trader? Do you like the one minute? Can you look at the four hour and find a nice support zone, wait for that pullback on the larger picture, and then go back to the smaller frames and look for those scalps back to the upside? You have to find a center ground. You can't just use the same system. I'm only watching the five minute. I'm only watching the 15. Use your advantage that you have. You can make multiple bias. A lot of people don't want to like use multiple systems. Multiple systems may be indicators. Maybe it's time frames. What's wrong with having more evidence as to why you should enter a trade or why you shouldn't? It's going to keep you in the game longer. Having that discipline, having a plan, and what you're planning to do before entering is one of the biggest things that I recommend for anybody. So I'm going to switch over to uh, Amazon now, and I do know where Amazon's at, so I can talk about this pretty well. I'm going to zoom out a lot real quick just to show you guys. Everything in tech, everything in consumer discrete or communication sector or the QQQ index, S&P, whatever you want to call it, most stuff has ran massive. Pull back, keep sending, 50-50, what's the answer to this equation? We don't know right now. So looking at Amazon, the bigger picture doesn't get, give much evidence. Yes, we have a nice dip buy area right here. So we have levels we can use. We have another level right here, few bounces, few rejections. But if we zoom in on this, this is where you have to understand the bigger picture for Amazon is not very clear. What is the smaller frames telling me with the current price action? And I hope you guys can see this like how I do. The first level I put, I'm going to keep. But look at this real quick. And I hope you guys see this when I put these levels in. I'm actually going to use some highlights so it's better to see. So we got three main levels on Amazon on the 30 minute. Even if you're on the one minute, you can see these zones as they go up and back down, up and back down. Have a plan with a stock that you know. I don't know if Coco's still here, but for those of you that don't know, Amazon is honestly his favorite thing to look at, favorite thing to trade. This is his like rock a baby, whatever you want to call it. He loves trading this because he knows it like the back of his hand. He knows the levels to enter. He knows the levels to sell. When levels reject, he knows not to chase on a fake breakout. He understands what to wait for. All me and him have talked about for the past weeks now. Where's my mouse? There you go. The only time I personally going to buy calls on Amazon, 127.5. Look at the zone. Historical rejections led to a now support. The breakout level is the 131 area, 
if this breaks out, it's going to have the same move as last time. I only want to buy calls, whether it's a scalp or a day trade or a swing trade, at the support zone down here. What it said was without that's when discipline comes into play. You have to understand from a mental perspective, if you trade Amazon at any point in this area in the middle, is it a 50-50 opportunity? Could it be something that you're not prepared for? And it could cause an issue with, okay, do I really want to enter this? Is the risk actually there? Will it affect my mental capacity if I buy in? And then after I sell for a loss, I zoom out and I realize like, like crap. That 127.5 is a support zone. I should have entered calls there and not at 128. And then it kept dropping to the downside. Use the bigger picture if you're a scalper. Understand where you need to start buying in for calls. Because if we take this down now to the five minute, opening sell off on Amazon, it may have scared people to think, I don't want to get calls. But knowing the historical movement on this, that was the entry for calls. That was the low risk, high reward. Size light, trust the move. Maybe add a week of time, add two weeks of time, size one contract. If you size, say, a thousand bucks and you're down 50%, that's 500 bucks you're down. If you size one contract for a hundred bucks, you can hold that to zero and you're losing a hundred bucks. Your emotions are not going to flare if you're only sized a hundred bucks and you're down 50%. So you're trusting if this zone holds, we can push back up easily two to three points on Amazon, two to three dollars a share. Trust and understand, know a plan and realize what to do. Uh, and said, do you swing at the money contracts? So for me personally, if I'm playing week of, I'm playing one slot out. So this dip buy area was 127.5. I'm buying week of 128 calls. If I'm buying next week expiration or the week after, this is when it depends on your portfolio size. For me, I can do it, but it also comes down to who you are. 130 is a psychological number. 128 next week is at the money, but it may cost more. Can you afford that? Playing the 130 call, as we push or if we push, that will draw people in because as 128 breaks, as 129 breaks, and we go into Monday next week, 130 is the logical buying point for the week of contracts. Aren't you scared of theta? I'm only scared of theta when I chase the play. If you buy in based off a zone, you're putting faith in the Greeks, in the chart. You're not worried about the reaction because you already know if we fail this zone, I'm basically selling right away. Uh, taking off early breezy, we'll see you then. Yeah, you're welcome, bro. You're welcome. So when you're buying off a support zone, you're looking at historical movements, the idea that it moves. So if you add a week or two of time, logically going off historical analysis, Amazon has a move within two to three days. So adding a week of time, two to three dollars out, that's a logical move that can happen. It's not a hope. Oh, I, I hope we hit 130 in, uh, next week. It's possible. So it's not a hopeful play. You're using historical analysis to give you that position. A lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to get 130 this week. That is a hopeful play. And that should scare you because if we don't push tomorrow, your contract's done. Like you're not making money on it. But if you get next week expiration and tomorrow we don't send yet, but we still hold this support, that 130 call, if you sized only one contract, you can afford to hold it compared to buying 10 contracts and then being down 20%. Being down 20% on five contracts from a financial standpoint may only be 60% loss on one contract, or it could be 80% loss on one contract. So it has your emotions basically dispersed. There's no like evidence of having emotions in that light size play. Trusting the zones is big. And if you're on the smaller frames, let's go to the one minute for Amazon. And let's say we don't even have this zone here. We like you guys understand now this is a zone. Anywhere in this area around 127.5, that is a buying zone for Amazon for a dip buy. If I delete this and all we see is Amazon do this at open, it could scare people into not taking a call position not realizing, okay, we're slowly holding higher lows. We're slowly forming a trend. If we go back on the one minute, notice how every dip had the same formation when it came down. We would hit and we'd slowly make higher lows, slowly make those higher lows, then we push up. So you're using that historical analysis. Uh, Ange said, at the money cons have higher theta, and out of the money have very less theta. Wouldn't out the money make more sense? But I do understand the scenario of getting at the money. 
So the reason theta is higher for at the money is because contracts cost more. So if you actually do the percentages for a contract cost compared to the theta differential, the percent is less when you're at the money for like, say theta is uh, $20 at the money and the contract costs 100. That's a one to five. If you buy out of the money and the contract's 50 bucks, the theta could be uh, 15. The theta is less, but it has more of an effect on the contract, if that makes sense. So it's not always about what's the theta, but what's the correlation with the contract cost and then the theta associated with it. That's a big thing that people need to uh, also realize, and that will be a topic uh, later on, maybe into August, once we get through the basics. So now I'm going to uh, switch over to Microsoft, and this will be the last one that we look at, guys. And I'm glad someone brought this up because when we zoom out on Microsoft, which if you guys were at the charting session this past week, you should already know where Microsoft stands on the time frame. This is the all-time high that we have up here. I do got a, there we go. This is around the all-time high and Microsoft is holding trends. And I'm going to take this down to the 30 minute just so we can see more candles. And here we go. So using the bigger picture before a scalper standpoint of the one minute, the two minute, the three minute, whatever you guys may use, knowing the bigger picture. I'm hoping people that scalp in here are not getting upset with me saying, always look at the bigger picture before you scalp. If you understand where the main zones are on the larger frames, scalping makes it so much easier to wait for those zones because a heavy sell-off may think that you have to get puts, not realizing we may be dropping off into a buy zone. A lot of people want to wait for the breakout, and that's fine. Breakouts are fine. But also realize breakouts reject. Rejections are normal. Push, rejection, push. That's where we currently are. Microsoft's trying to have that next push upside. But usually we have rejections around this zone. So is there potential for Microsoft to continue? Or should, we, should you wait for another dip buy? Today's sell-off was one of the chances to get Microsoft for a cheaper contract price before the push to the upside. At this point, as a scalper, you have to realize if we don't break out, you have to take that small percent gain, 20%, 30%. If you would have entered today at the lows, which if I switch to the one minute, and I got to zoom out again, there we go. Trends slowly started to form higher lows and higher highs on Microsoft. So as a scalper, say you see this dip, and it's going up, it's going up. And I'm going to delete this red highlight so I can talk more about the day of and not distract you guys. So many people need to see the move before entering. And uh, deep uh, pack, I see what you just said. Don't worry. A lot of people need to see the move before entering. So what if someone got calls in this area on this initial push? We dropped off, now we're pushing. They get calls around here. Say their mindset is, I want to hold this for the day. They go up green instantly pull back slightly red, pushes up, maybe break even, maybe slightly red based off data and the contract they bought. And then we have a quick drop off. Can they afford to hold if they oversized? If they size light and they stick to the plan, they said they're holding regardless. So if they stick to the plan, they're fine. But imagine if you would have waited to see how this stock played out. You would have had two different chances to buy in after that initial drop off had opened. You could have bought in on the second trend bounce. Come on, what are you doing? There we go. Second trend, or potentially, yes, we broke below on this next trend, but look at the consolidation that held. And I'm pretty sure if I bring up the VWAP, that may be around the actual area. So let me check. So VWAP's the blue line. Uh, I think I mentioned this last time. Ignore the top and the bottom greens, but the blue is the actual VWAP you'll see on majority of brokers. Microsoft was trying to hold trends of higher lows. Yes, the trend line's not dead on if I pull this down, but focus on the idea. The VWAP is right at that price action. And I guarantee if someone was trying to buy, oh, how do I remove this? There we go. If someone was trying to buy calls around this area right here, calls would have been cheaper after having more evidence as to when I should enter, having more of a chart set up to know, okay, it's safer if I enter here because logically if I enter at this second highlight here for calls, my selling point can either be the previous higher low break or it's just when I'm comfortable to sell for a loss if I size light. P 
people tend to want to race into the play, not realizing if I zoom out on the bigger picture, a swing trade on Microsoft right now could be a solid setup. We're making higher lows on the bigger picture. And that dip confirmed, we just had another higher low. So the bigger picture is now looking strong still, but on, in the moment, quick sell off it open, then we push up, we pull back again. It could have shaken some people out if they chased the play and then a pullback happened. They're thinking, I got to get out. I'm down 30%. I can't afford to hold this. Add time to a contract like this. Yes, you're a scalper, but sometimes you have to understand the bigger move. Or if you don't like playing and you don't have patience, I mean, uh, and you do have patience, you can buy and hold. But if you don't have patience, you basically have to wait for the breakout and then the recontest. This resistance will break on the upside and it logically should have a pullback to hold its support. And that will give you conviction to buy into calls if you're a breakout trader and ride this up. Uh, if you have time, can you talk about Meta, please? So yeah, let's end on Meta. We have, a, uh, it's nine o'clock right now, but I'll switch over to Meta real quick. So the first thing that I want to bring up, because this is one thing that I've talked about for weeks now, we finally hit the level that I was telling you guys, Meta's going to hit 300 a share. And sure enough, it finally did. So if I zoom out on the four hour, we just filled the gap to the upside after the horrible earnings release they had back in February. So this gap fill, we finally filled. At this point, from a larger perspective, how much higher can we go? Is a retraction needed after filling the gap from those earnings back in February of 2022? So you have to realize what's next. If this is a scout play, on the larger picture, you have to realize this is a rejection zone. I can't just buy a scalp call and just hold it and hope it keeps going. So now you have to look on the smaller picture for those trends to hold. The buy entry I told you guys about was a break above this yellow highlight. And I have to go to the 15 to see this better. There we go. This yellow highlight, I told you guys, if we break out above the yellow, look for a pullback and ascend. And sure enough, Meta had that exact setup. We broke above. People may have chased this for a swing. The very next day, we sold off, and they may have uh, went back to red on the day for that trade. It sent right off that level, also holding trends of higher lows. Now that we're pulling back, focus on where we're at on this pullback. Historical resistance, which now could switch to support. Is Meta going to hold, though? Because on the larger picture, like you see on this red highlight, this is a rejection zone. Taking that rejection zone away, though, on the smaller frames, we're at a now support, resistance to support flip. That's why it's very important to not only just use one method, but try and use more biased opinions into your decision making. Larger picture meta is rejecting because we filled the gap, but tech is hot. Communication sector is hot. Can we keep pushing? If you're playing this for a day trader or a scalp, we need a pullback. So now that you're using the smaller frames, Use historical uh, rejections, that resistance zone. See if it can hold support. Is this going to bounce tomorrow for a zero DTE play? I'm not too sure. But if you add time and size light, you can wait and see if this play marinates. And maybe it dips down a little bit more down to this area. But it holds strength and it pushes back up next week. There's always more to it than just I'm on the one minute. We're selling off heavy on uh, meta today. Because if I'm on the one minute, Yes, we did sell off massive after a push, but if we zoom out on the five minute or the 15, look where that pullback is slowly approaching. The historical rejection that could not break until we finally did. So using that, you have a more bigger perspective now. Do you guys have any questions, any concerns? Uh, 3700, the AI, we'll look at that in a second after I uh, stop this recording. Is there anything else you guys want to hear about? Anything you want me to speak on with time frames, with a scalper, day trader, or a swing trader? Mindset questions, possibly. Some used to say sell in May and go away, but more like sell in June and go away. I mean, we're, I mean, market is never consistent. Every year is different. Volatility is different. Uh, AIs are different. Not AI is advanced technology, but computer systems with algos. You have to realize times are changing as we're speaking right now. Everyone on vacation. If we sell off, you can make money. That's the best part about options. 
uh, level two. So level two, we will speak about uh, later, maybe in August or uh, September area. I don't want to speak on stuff that uh, high tech. So if that's what you're looking for, uh, reach out to me through DMs and I can maybe speak with you a little bit privately. But I don't want to really get into like level two is very high tech for new traders. It's very hard to use it from a util, uh, like utilizing it to your potential more so than, oh, I'm watching level two, this level, like this order just came in. You have to know how to use level two and not just watch it and assume what's going to happen. But we will talk about that at some point, I promise. Staircase up, elevator down. Exactly. So I'm going to stop this recording.